Hi there. We're slowly moving from winter into spring, and, well, that means the weather can get a bit wet and dreary. So what's better, in those circumstances, than diving into a fantasy or sci-fi world? Join me today as I share some of my favourite books with you. Welcome aboard the International Express to Book Central. Grab a seat, settle in, and let's while away the journey with some book chat. I'm your host Jules, and fantasy and sci-fi are probably my favourite genres. I'm a big medieval literature reader, as you will know, but it is those two genres, sci-fi and fantasy, which really allow me to just escape the kind of humdrum of everyday life. So when, like today, for example, while I'm recording, it's raining outside, there is not a speck of blue sky to be seen, well, that's the perfect time to dive into a completely new world. So today I've got a couple of titles lined up for you, and those are what we're going to be talking about. The first duology that I'm going to tell you about, so a series of books made up of two, unlike a trilogy, which is three, is the Radiant Emperor duology by Shelley Parker Chan. This duology takes place in the 14th century in China, and it literally starts during a drought, so it couldn't be more opposite to the weather we're currently having, well, at least here in Germany. In the first of the duology, She Who Became the Sun, we get to meet a young girl who is a peasant, and she's currently kind of stuck in her village, which is stricken by famine, and she has to make a choice, which is between her own fate, which has been predicted to be nothing, and that of her slightly older brother, who has been destined for greatness. So what will she do? What she does is she chooses her brother's destiny. And so, under his name, Zhu Zhongba goes out into the world. Then the question remains, will this destiny work out for her? Will the heavens find out that she has claimed another person's destiny? Or will she be able to hold on to the little that she's been able to kind of ring out of the world for herself. (laughs) Now, the reason that I adore She Who Became the Sun and also its sequel, He Who Drowned the World, is that Shelley Parker Chan has an amazing ability of kind of laying out a scene for you. They're really good at picturing a landscape, at shifting with the different scenery. So at times we're in the desert, then we're in an old walled city. Then we find ourselves kind of near a swampy river or in a monastery or on a ship. And it really just transports you, this duology. I really had the feeling like I was in a completely different world and that I was getting to see new sights. And it's so vivid that I would I would sometimes have to look up for my book and go, wait, OK, no, I am actually still at home. I'm not in 14th century China. So this is a book I could highly recommend for taking you out of your everyday life. And on top of that, you get to learn a little bit of Chinese history, admittedly through a fictionalized lens, but still, it's all about the Mongol conquest of China and the dynasty that grew out of that and the way in which uh, Han Chinese rebelled, etc. So you get all kinds of different things here. Admittedly, the books can get a bit gory, At times, there is definitely loss of limb, warfare, all that kind of stuff. And there are times also explicit sex scenes. And especially the second book, He Who Drowned the World, also goes quite deeply into, well, these issues of guilt and betrayal and and being stuck on a path and not being quite sure how to get out of it, the decisions you might have to make in order to make it to the next step of your journey and whether those decisions are actually worth where you will hopefully end up. So there are a lot of heavy themes going on there, but I also enjoy that. It distracts me from, you know, the admin I need to do (laughs) or the kind of nothingness happening outside of my window. So they kind of give me these little impulses to also think a little bit deeper. With The Radiant Emperor Duology by Shelley Parker-Chan, you're going to get 
exciting new landscapes, fascinating characters that you're going to end up rooting for and then wonder, who are these people? Are they good? Are they bad? <laughs> are they conflicted? How dark is their shade of morally grey? You're going to get exciting battles. You're going to get intrigue. And like I said, you're absolutely going to feel like you're somewhere else. And nonetheless, despite being taken somewhere else by this book, you're going to get things out of it that will kind of help you in your everyday life as well. So that's my first recommendation. My second recommendation is a trilogy that started around the same time as that by Shelley Parker Chung. They kind of came out in the same summer and were part of the sapphic triad. Um, and that is the Burning Kingdoms trilogy by Tasha Suri. Full disclosure, I have to admit, so far I've only read the first of these books. I've got the other two saved for this dreary spring. <laughs> so you can be right there along with me as you read them. The Burning Kingdoms trilogy starts with the Jasmine Throne, in which we get to encounter a variety of different characters, but the one that we mostly follow is Malini, who has been imprisoned by her brother and spends most of her time at an ancient temple which was once the source of powerful magic. But now it's kind of a bit of a ruin, and admittedly the entire empire is maybe a little bit in ruin and in danger of falling to the wrong heir. Another character is Priya, who is a servant who also works at that temple at the Hirana. And she's actually kind of happy to be a bit anonymous, to not have people really know about her past or her history. But it comes to the point where Priya and Malini have to decide whether they trust each other, if they're working towards the same goal, if they are both intent on preventing Malini's treacherous brother from taking the throne to their empire. So... Are they going to work together? What about this magic, which has kind of seemed to disappear from the land, but might still be hidden somewhere? When I read The Jasmine Throne, I was really looking for fantasy that would take me out of the Eurocentric focus of, you know, The Lord of the Rings, which I adore, but I'd read so many fantasy books which were kind of repeating the things that Tolkien had done, and not necessarily in a better way. And then when I realized that the Jasmine Throne was inspired by India and by its history, and that Tasha Suri was bringing all kinds of mythology, folklore, etc. into it, I was completely on board. The empire in which the story takes place is the Ahiranya, and it has been subjugated for a very long time by another force, so we're also kind of dealing with colonial imperial thinking here, and the way in which Tasha Suri describes this this empire and this land under its control, the way she works with the language and the culture and the history is beautiful. At times, again, like the Radiant Empire duology, there is violence there, but it's also very real and beautiful in a certain way. Again, this is a trilogy which will give you a certain escapism, but it would then help you encounter certain things, think about certain things, which then when you, you know, close the book and come back to the real world, well, you'll have things that you can move forward with, you'll have new ideas, etc. Also, the way in which Tasha Suri writes her world, the only word that kind of fits is kind of lush, it feels so alive, and there are so many beautiful details that she describes in such a way that you can really vividly picture them. And you've got this ancient temple, and you've got an empire that you get to know. You've got a captive princess. You've got an anonymous servant who is kind of maybe not just a servant, who's got more in their past. And it really comes alive. And it introduced me to a whole new kind of culture and history because I hadn't read as much specifically Indian literature or literature based upon Indian stories. I really felt like I could feel the heat of the land or kind of smell the trees and things like that. So it's really vivid and it's beautiful. And on top of that, there's some delightful tension between our characters. You know, you get an italicized, oh, for example, and that is always really fun. It is a big book, The Jasmine Throne. It's about 500 plus pages, and that's only the first one, but I cannot wait to get into the other two. The second book is called The Odi and the Sword, and the third and final book is called The Lotus Empire. And yeah, 
those are on my list for this spring. And hey, maybe you'll read along with me. For my next recommendation, we're diving into science fiction, specifically into Stations of the Tide by Michael Swanwick. I recently read a kind of re-release of this book, which first came out in the 90s, and I just had no idea that you could also write science fiction like this, <laughs> um, which maybe sounds a bit pretentious as if I'm like, oh, I know how science fiction works. But at a certain point, you build up a certain familiarity with how science fiction authors like to build up their stories, the worlds they like to create, you know, where you have a sand planet, a water planet, a city planet, etc. And you're like, great, I know these worlds. And then you read a science fiction book from the 90s and it's just, it completely <laughs> throws everything you thought was standard out of the window and does something completely different. And well, that is Stations of the Tide. This novel takes place on Miranda, which is a planet. And I think every two centuries, Miranda is hit by what they call the Jubilee Tides, which will drown most of the planet under its ocean. And this is about to happen. But before that can happen, we have our main character, who's just called the Buriocrat, and he needs to go down to Miranda and hunt down a man who may or may not be a magician, and who may or may not have stolen prescribed technology, which kind of the larger structure of intergalactic planets is not happy about. They don't want this planet to have access to technology that is too advanced for them. Okay, I'm now realizing that a lot of my science fiction and fantasy engages with empires potentially oppressing other planets. That's clearly a theme that is playing in a lot of these books, but that I'm also just very interested in. Anyway, so we have this bureaucrat. He's on a planet which is about to get drowned in water, something which everyone is on the one hand a bit freaked out about, and on the other hand, it happens every two centuries, so it's not that new. But so you get these descriptions of of a planet which is used to kind of changing as the water hits. So there are kind of barnacles on the houses and the plants and animals are able to maybe adapt and suddenly become fish uh, rather than a bird. And it kind of plays with your assumption of whether things are as they seem, as they say that they are. At its heart, Stations of the Tide is technically something of a detective novel where the bureaucrat has to hunt down this magician slash thief so you're kind of following him as he picks up different clues and hopefully gets closer and closer to his goal so there's a kind of drive to it that's really propulsive that will definitely keep you reading and then on the other hand as the bureaucrat moves through miranda you get all of these little details and little snippets of the world and michael swanwick just kind of trusts you to go along with it he places a lot of trust in you as the reader to follow him. And if you get new information that you don't entirely understand, if suddenly there's magic, if suddenly there are maybe robot surrogates who can take your personality and identity and make sure you can be present somewhere else as well, follow him. Go along with it. If the briefcase suddenly starts speaking to the bureaucrat, go along with it. So this is a book that will not bore you at any point without making you feel like you're lost. The novel will make sure that you're constantly just amazed and surprised at things that are coming up. But it's presented, like I said, in such a way that it doesn't alienate you as a reader, but rather it just makes you want to dive in even deeper. And kind of as the bureaucrat gets lost on Miranda a little bit, so do you as the reader. And, and you start thinking like, okay, what's going on here? And on the other hand, you just want to keep seeing things. You want to keep exploring. You want to figure out why there is a massive cruise ship in the forest. Like, how did it end up there? And things like that. So it will just fill your mind with all kinds of stunning imagery and also just delightful prose. At times, this is one of those books where I did have to laugh out loud and it brought a little bit of cheer into my life in that way. So yeah, my third recommendation is Stations of the Tide by Michael Swanwick. My next recommendation dives back into the fantasy genre, and it's Nettle and Bone by T. Kingfisher. I read this book on a long journey, through miserable weather, on a train, and it was excellent. It was exactly what I needed to distract myself from the fact that I hadn't actually booked a seat on this train, and I might therefore be kicked out of my seat at any time. <laughs> so, Nettle and Bone is about Mara, 
and well, she's in a bit of a pickle right at the start. So she is the youngest of three daughters, and she happens to be a princess, but she got shunted off to a nunnery when she was kind of just before she reached adulthood, while her older sisters got married off to a prince. Well, the oldest got married off to a prince and then tragically died. And now the second one is married to him. And Mara is like, something is up. Something's not right. Admittedly, I've been in a nunnery for the last, well, decade at least, I think. And I will have to figure out what's going on. I'm going to have to save a princess. But how do you do that? Especially when you've mostly been raised in a nunnery and you're very good at, you know, sewing things, but not necessarily at picking up a sword or passing magic trials. So that's the pickle Mara is in. And we kind of meet her halfway through this adventure already. And then T. Kingfisher does a great job of filling in some background detail so that we know what's going on and joining Mara on her quest towards saving her sister, saving a princess. What I enjoy a lot about Nettle and Bone is the way that it works with fairy tales, with, with the weird logic that fairy tales have, you know, where it's like, well, of course you're going to be sent into the woods, and of course you're going to find a gingerbread house there, and you might just have to fight a witch. Like, that's just what happens to you and your sister, I'm sorry, you know? That kind of logic. And T. Kingfisher kind of plays with that, where Mara absolutely knows that as the youngest sister, as the third sister, it is her job to set out on this task. And yet, how do you go about it? What do you do? There are some clues that you can pick up on, but, well, for the rest, you're going to have to figure it out. And the novel never requires Mara to be anything more than she is, which maybe sounds a bit odd if you're used to fantasy novels where our main character is the chosen one who's going to discover that they're half immortal or they have some secret magic powers and etc. etc. Mara is what she is, which is admittedly a princess, but also, well, mostly a nun based on her experience, and she's determined, but she's also a bit scared, and those are the qualities that we're going to kind of be weaving through. However, this novel will also give you a goblin market, a demonic chicken, and an ancient seeress or fairy. And the way T. Kingfisher sketches these different locations, these different characters for you, on the one hand, it's very smooth, and it almost reads too easily, which I think belies how complicated it is to write something kind of as intricate and imaginative as Nettle and Bone, because T. Kingfisher just kind of takes you by the hand and also takes Mara by the hand a little bit, and we just work our way through this fairy tale adventure as a trio. And that's delightful. So if you're looking for fun fantasy that doesn't lean too heavily on the romance side, that also doesn't get too intricate when it comes to massive kind of politics or something like that. If you want to step into a world that feels comfortably fantasy-like and fairy tale like with a story that also plays with elements of, well, how does it feel to be in a fairy tale? What does it feel like to be set on this hero's journey and not being sure you can actually do it? Then Nettle and Bone will be perfect for you. And all the scenery, all the settings will just make you feel like you're in an entirely new world. My next recommendation is for those science fiction readers who don't necessarily have the time in spring to sit down for an entire book. And then my recommendation, therefore, is The Hole in the Moon and Other Stories by Margaret Sinclair. These stories are delightfully sci-fi in the sense that one of the stories will literally just be like, we've discovered space travel and you could now send your annoying partner up to space and they won't even know you did it. Isn't that delightful? And then of course there's a twist. So it kind of plays with these stereotypical sci-fi images and tells you a really interesting story or a really funny story. And all of these stories are quite short. But they're not necessarily to the point, like a lot of them will still keep you thinking. Some of them get quite mystical. So for example, that story I just mentioned about a married couple who may or may not be willing to use space travel to solve their marital issues. That's the first one. It's called Rocket to Limbo. It's short, sweet, and it will make you laugh. On the other hand, there are also stories in this collection like The Hierophants, in which a junk salvage mission on a remote asteroid 
turns into a kind of Lovecraftian but very beautiful and lyrical religious experience with a potentially tragic twist. And that combination, that back and forth, means that every time you dive into a new story, you're being taken to a different part of space, but also to a different part of the human experience. Uh, there are these light touches, these really fun stories, and then there are the ones that get a little bit deeper and a little bit darker. There's also just a lot of laughs to be had in this collection. There are stories that will just genuinely make you laugh out loud, even while what's happening is potentially, you know, dangerous, because, for example, it takes place in space or on a different planet or with aliens. But yeah, that's basically a really fun collection to get into. You can dive into each of these stories, spend a day or two, three on them, and then go into the next story. And each time, Margaret Sinclair will give you a little escape. The next book I'm going to recommend to you is an absolute favorite of mine, and I've been recommending it left, right, and center, so it was only time that I recommended it to y'all as well. And this book is The Actual Star by Monica Byrne. Where to begin with the story? So The Actual Star takes place across three different timelines, and these timelines also set in three different millennia. The first takes place in 1012, so a good thousand years ago, where we have two royal Mayan twins who are preparing to take on the throne and they want to restore their empire to prosperity. And they also have a younger sister, Ket. Then the second storyline takes place in 2012, in which we meet a girl called Leah from Minnesota who travels to Belize because she wants to reconnect with her roots. And there she meets two twins who are tour guides. The third storyline takes place in 3012, in which kind of religion and climate change have just led to a completely different world. And in that storyline, we meet two different thinkers and travelers who imagine the future in a different way, who want to make different changes to how we live. Now, that feels like a lot to have to deal with, but the way Monica Byrne interweaves these three storylines the way that, for example, she connects the fact that in each storyline we have these three central characters and how these patterns repeat themselves through time, how certain lessons maybe need to be learned again, but how we can also move forward with knowledge from the past. Um, it's just done so well. And Monica Byrne just takes you to three completely different places. You have the jungles of the Mayan kingdom that uh, our first storyline takes place in. And you get to work with these ruins and the and the forest and the jungle around it. And, and the weight of tradition on the shoulders of those three kind of imperial heirs. That is beautiful. And it's something that I hadn't read before. And then even the storyline in 2012 where you're like, okay, I lived in 2012. So I kind of remember what that was like. Still, Monica Byrne draws out different elements from that experience, and Leah is such a central and fascinating character. The way in which she views the world, the way she opens herself up to love but also to pain is beautiful, and she really forms the heart of the novel in some ways. And then there is a storyline in the future, and that one absolutely blew my mind. The way that Monica Byrne re-envisions a world after climate change, after catastrophe and war, and, and how there is, on the one hand, so much kind of hope and connection there and a certain kind of freedom that gets built up and how yet, nonetheless, they're also working against certain restrictions and against certain fears. And how do you open yourself up to the unknown and things like that? So the actual star, I could never really explain how much this book actually means to me <laughs> and how well written it is and how it would just transport you to all these different places, all these different kinds of worlds that yet feel very familiar and like you could live in them. So yeah, I just have to say it's a great book. So if you take anything from this episode, let it be that the actual star is a stunner and that you should pick it up. My final recommendation takes us back into sci-fi again as well, and it feels like perhaps a bit of an obvious recommendation, and that is June by Frank Herbert. Now, I am going to try and put together a proper episode on June itself, just before the film releases, but 
I just felt like I had to recommend it here as well because my experience with reading June was almost obsessive. <laughs> I had already seen the movie, which covers the first half of the book. And I was like, okay, I'm intrigued about this world. I want to know more. And then I started reading the book and it just became this propulsive kind of experience where I wanted to know more and more. And I was just imagining all these details and it literally took me out of my own life for a bit. I wasn't entirely present <laughs> for the week or so uh, in which I read June, listened to podcasts about June, listened to the soundtrack of the film and just reread it. And in the following weeks, I then read the other two books, which weren't as great, but hey. The world that gets created in June is one which is fascinating. It is just clear enough in, with what Frank Herbert tells you that you can picture it, that you can imagine it, but he leaves enough of it so vague that you can ask endless questions and you can just, on the one hand, go in circles and keep, you know, cycling down in the spiral of, and what's this and what's that and how would this work? And what was that revolution about? And why can't they use computers? And who is the emperor? And is he a god or is he just a man? All of those kind of things. So June, the novel, is about the planet Arrakis. And Arrakis is the place in which you can gather spice, almost like a drug, I guess, which is required for space travel because they no longer use computers and machinery in that way after there was something of an AI revolution, I think, but that's very much in the background. So spice can only be gathered on the planet Arrakis. And so far, Arrakis has been stewarded by the Harkonnen family, but the emperor has decided, nope, now it's time for the Atreides family to be the kind of counts or rulers over Arrakis. So Duke Atreides arrives and with him comes his son Paul, who is a special kid. His mother is some kind of nun slash witch and therefore Paul reacts to June in a certain way. He kind of interacts with this planet, but the planet has also kind of been prepared for his arrival, so he seems to be a savior in the making. But is having a savior a good thing? That's really a question the book asks, and it's not necessarily a question you can pick up straight away, but there's a lot of criticism of this idea of like, oh, here comes a savior off planet, and he's going to save us, and he's going to educate the masses, etc. So it kind of plays with those mythological themes and also kind of religious imagery. And then it's also just hardcore sci-fi in the sense there are all kinds of different spaceships and there are different creatures and there are galactic senates and empires and dukes and counts and maybe atomic bombs and no computers, though, no computers. But there is something like a Bible. So it's a fascinating mix of all kinds of different things. It will absolutely draw you in if you open yourself up to it. A difference here is, like I said, with Michael Swanwick's novel, Stations of the Tide, he will kind of drag you along into different scenes and moments that seem a bit odd, but it works with Swanwick in a way that you completely trust him and he trusts you to follow along and that things will make sense if they're meant to make sense. If they're meant to be surprising and weird, they'll stay surprising and weird. In June, Frank Herbert throws up a lot of things and he'll be like, and then this happened, and I'm not going to mention that again, but it's very important. And so you can get a little bit lost in the world. There are appendices to June, which explain, you know, how the timeline works, how the planets work, and all of that stuff, who the different big families are and why they matter, etc. To a certain extent, you might need those appendices <laughs> to make sense of what is happening. So you have to go into June with a very open mind. You have to allow information to stream in, and some of it you're also just going to have to let go. Because holding on to certain things and being like, I hope Frank Herbert explains it, he might not. So you got to go with the flow when it comes to June. But June is one of those books that really took me out of my own world. It, it really kind of <laughs> took over my life and changed the way I looked at things for a bit. And then thankfully that kind of wore off and I could go back to reading other things and reconnecting with my housemates and my cat, for example, water my plants. But for a while, it completely took me out of myself. And well, I think that is the perfect book to end these recommendations on. And that's it for today. If you have questions, 
thoughts on the book, or recommendations or requests for future episodes, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email at bookcentralpod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. You can also subscribe to be informed when new episodes drop. You can find references to the materials used today in the description. Book Central is written and produced by me, and our music is by Scott Buckley. Thank you for joining me today on the International Express to Book Central.